it's the big moment. Let's see if they did what they said they were gonna do. They really did it. This is great. So now I can um, I can actually use the whiteboard. I need to bring my tripod in here. Or maybe, lonely office hour, bird's eye view. That might work, but I also kind of like being closer to it. I don't know. I'm going to have to, uh, gonna have to think it through. But that's not the only surprise we have on today's episode. We have, here we go. You see that, now this is great. I don't know how you feel about blueberry coffee, but blueberry coffee is awesome. But this, every time I have it, brings me back to teaching debate workshops in the summer at the University of Vermont. Because uh, they always had this at the bookstore, and after lunch I go get a cup of this and, and go teach the afternoon away. So it brings me back to a very uh, pleasant pedagogical moment in my life where I was doing this summer teaching stuff and it just felt like um, you're really accomplishing something and that things were really uh, clipping along. It really felt like the way teaching ought to feel. And uh, occasionally still, I still have that kind of feeling, but it was nothing like that. I think it was because it was just so new to me. But this uh, flavor of this coffee brings me right back to that. So I think it's appropriate to have it in the office. And I bought enough to survive um, the end of time. So I have enough here for, for everyone if there's an apocalypse. We just need hot water and a Keurig machine and electricity. Um, so hopefully those things will survive the apocalypse. And then we can have blueberry coffee while we, um, you know, watch civilization collapse. The other thing I got was to help me maybe make better videos up here, but also just for meetings and stuff, which is a snowball microphone, which I was told is excellent. So we'll play with this later today, too. So this will be a good episode. The coffee and technology, pretty much my identity. I actually had an extremely busy day uh, today planned, but I just got word that my mandatory training was canceled, uh, which is great. Um, the trainings are good. It's good that they're doing them. I don't feel like I particularly need to go, but it's interesting to see the people have revelations that, like, you know, you have when you're like a master student reading critical theory. And they have these revelations like in there, you know, later on. So it's good that they're having them. Like people in business or math or science who don't think about these kind of um, things like identity and uh, stuff like that. But um, the thing about these trainings, you might think your trainings are bad where you work, but university trainings are the worst because there's like 40 people in there. And every single one of those people is a professor for the most part, usually. The people who become professors are those annoying people from your classes who, when the professor was done with the day, and they're like, anything else? And you could, you're like, cool, we're getting out like 10 minutes early. I was like, I just had that one question about the reading, and then they go off for like five minutes, and the professor's like, oh, very good, well, no. And then they give their explanation. You end up being like two or three minutes over because of that person. Now, usually in a class, an undergrad class, there's one person like that, and everyone rolls their eyes at them. In the university training, the whole room is that person. Yeah. And my absolute favorite thing about these trainings are the older white men who monopolize halfway through by telling some personal story about themselves. And they're like, was I right? Did I do good? And then after everyone validates them, they kind of nod. And then they walk out 15 minutes early before everyone else. But we have to cover the rest of the material. Those are my absolute favorite people. 
at university training. So if you're one of those people, don't subscribe to the vlog. Well, it's almost the end of the day and I still haven't used the new whiteboard yet because you know how you get a new thing. It's so super nice. You kind of, you know, you're kind of looking at it and you're like, I can use that. But I know once I use it, it won't be as great as imagining to use it. So I guess we might use it next time. I might film uh, some lectures and stuff now that I have this. I can do some more direct teaching. I don't know, I guess I could use it to maybe talk about one thing uh, that's on my mind that might be a spark to the end of this lonely office hour. But we've been talking a lot about assessment and about um, grading and about assignments and what we're teaching. And uh, Today, oh, I do have to tell you one great story from today. I was teaching about the difference between what's possible and what's plausible in rhetoric, that's a pretty big distinction. Something possible, a lot of people in our, you know, pro-science environment, scientifically dominated discourse of the world, possibility is like, well, it could happen. It could happen. And that's good enough. Yeah, well, it could happen. But plausibility is, is it likely to happen? Is it plausible? Is it believable that that could happen? Which is a very different case. And so I said to the class, what does it mean if something's plausible? And one girl goes, which I thought was actually kind of brilliant. Um, something that could be clapped for, something that could be applauded. So here's the question I'm gonna leave you with and it'll be the first thing that we write on the new board. Ah, the decapping of the whiteboard marker. Reading is always justified to students in the terms of something else. And that's all fine and good. This is usually the way this goes. So for a student, if they can skip a step, if a student doesn't have to go here first to get over here, they feel like they have become efficient. They might go directly into it and hope for the best. Now we know that the reason that we assign reading is not so that we can assign a quiz, a paper, or a test. The reading isn't there so that we can have one of these things. So these things are designed to make sure they read the valuable thing. But unfortunately, there's a miscommunication here. The value to the student is because they need the grade. They need the good grade on the quiz or the paper or the test. So that's the value of the reading for them. So the problem is that we communicate the value of the reading through something that's an exchange, something that, you know, is going to have a point exchange or a grade exchange. And this system generally works pretty well, but it's an accidental system. They accidentally read and, and remember the thing because they have to know it for a test or something. But if they can get away with not reading it and just take the test to the quiz, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you do that? So here's the, the question or the issue that I'm uh, thinking about is a possible solution, but I don't really know how to get there. It's very difficult when you work in the university, the university is based on exchange. It's based on exchange and something that mirrors or mimics a kind of a capitalist system, right? a system of, um, uh, of uh, credits of exchange or units of exchange um, where you get paid basically in terms of grades or points in order to do the labor that the boss, i.e. the professor makes you do. So how do we get out of that? How do I encourage reading for its own sake or reading has a value in of itself uh, depending on whether or not it was um, uh, assigned a quiz or something like that. So how do we get the students to read and reading becomes its own assignment? I have no idea. Instead of reading as something one does because you have to, because there's a quiz, how do you make that happen? The answer might be in something like community values, creating that community in the classroom. But other than that, I'm really at the starting point of thinking about that, about this relationship. I don't know.